Hi, everybody, and welcome back to the ALD Stories podcast. Many of us in the ALD community are familiar with the ALD reactor, with the turning of wrenches, the cumbersome precursor transfers, the field experiments. But what if there was a tool to make this easier on ourselves? My guest today has something to say about this. This episode, we are heading to Ireland, a country that, in spite of its popular opinion, I do not have any heritage from. And here we will talk with Professor Michael Nolan, head of materials modeling for devices group at the Tyndall National Institute. Tyndall National Institute, located at University College Cork, is one of Europe's foremost research centers for integrated information and communication technologies. Mike, the first student to join this group in the 90s, specializes in the use of molecular and animistic models to help predict, understand, and screen ALD precursors and chemistries. Some of Mike's work includes modeling plasma-assisted deposition of cobalt films, mechanistic studies of HF pulses, and first principle studies of MLD processes. While the use of modeling has been around for decades, we are witnessing a huge upswing in its adoption for atomic layer processes as a predictive tool, offering experimentalists a wealth of information, including chemistry viability, reaction pathways, and growth mechanisms. Mike and I have a great conversation about all things modeling, including basics for modeling ALD reactions, limitations of current modeling efforts, and how theorists and experimentalists can powerfully work together. I had such a great time chatting with Mike, and I'm very grateful for his contribution to the show. So grab your tea or coffee, and please enjoy episode 13 of the ALD Stories podcast. Welcome to ALD Stories, a series of conversations where we share the untold stories of atomic layer deposition and the people behind the technology. This podcast is brought to you by Benek, the home of ALD. And uh, hi, Michael. We are on a lovely, let's see, is it a, a Wednesday afternoon? And I'm here with Michael Nolan from the Tyndall National Institute in Ireland. Michael, thank you so much for taking some time out of your day to uh, chat with me. It's really great to have you here and nice to be talking with you again. Hi, Tyler. Yeah, thanks a million for the invitation and the opportunity to have a chat with you about, about what we do. I'm looking forward to the conversation. Great. So maybe just to start off, we could get a little bit of a background introduction from you, Michael. Um, so you are working at Tyndall National Institutes, and you are working as the head of the group materials modeling for devices, which also, if I remember right, this is a new promotion for you, correct? Yes. Yes. I, I got this promotion a month ago now. So it's an exciting opportunity to really grow what we're doing. That's great. Well, congratulations. And you know, maybe you. you give us a little background on what this uh, position is for you and uh, how this relates to maybe our conversation on ALD today. Yeah, okay. So um, within Tyndall, which is um, a, a part of University College Cork and is Ireland's kind of national research um, lab in the area of information communication technologies and, and deep tech, being the, the kind of new focus um, in this space. Th there's always been a strong materials modeling activity. Um, and actually I was the first student um, uh, at master's level in this group back in 1997. And this involves basically using um, computer simulations that solve the quantum mechanical Schrodinger equation which basically describes how electrons and atoms move around and make and break chemical bonds. And we use that to look at interesting questions in materials for electronics, for healthcare, for energy. And on top of that, then, in the last 20 years, we had a significant effort led by Simon Elliott in the modeling of atomic level processing, mainly ALD, which of course is the subject of this podcast. So Simon had developed the group into a, a, a leading um, group in the, the space with many collaborations across um, academic groups, other research institutes and industry um, in modeling um, ALD processes. My own background was in surface chemistry and I did do a postdoc on ALD modeling of high K dielectric deposition. And then I developed a research activity focused on surface chemistry for catalysis, uh, things like water splitting, carbon dioxide reduction, and um, <clears throat> thermal catalysis for methane conversion. 
And then in 2018, I, I took over the running of this activity when I was um, in a senior researcher role. And we've grown it out then to encompass work in molecular layer deposition, MLD of hybrid organic inorganic materials, and also atomic layer etching, um, studying the, the mechanisms of, of thermal ALE using hydrogen fluoride. And so the, the group um, currently is um, five PhD students, four postdocs, one of whom is an experimentalist that actually does film deposition for us. So that's a new um, avenue and, and quite exciting. Um, and, and so we have a number of projects funded by national agencies, Horizon 2020, um, industry and um, enterprise partnerships where we develop mainly new process chemistries for uh, various deposition and etch um, problem statements. So, so our, our remit is, is you can come to us with a problem statement. You'd like to maybe understand a process or check um, for potential processes or understand why a process doesn't work. And we can do our atomistic modeling to help you um, answer these questions. And so th this is very valuable across both the academic and industrial space. Um, we're also the largest user of Tyndall's own high performance computing infrastructure and the uh, national supercomputing center called iCheck. And um, because these are very large calculations involving surfaces with complex um, species on them. And then you're bringing in big complex molecules, that is your precursors, and you're seeing how they interact at the surface to give you the target material and you various quantities you need to calculate, which um, require a lot of computing resources. So this is a, a, a very a compute resource heavy activity, but we have very good codes. We've lots of experience in doing it. And so we can do it very efficiently compared to spending time and resources in the lab. And so as head of group, I direct those activities, supervise, postdocs and students um, and bring in the necessary research funding. And then we also develop strategy around atomic level processing, um, both within the group, but also within the wider Tyndall um, infrastructure where we have experimental group in the space and a lot of other groups using our ALD um, facilities. So this positions us as a, as a leading European Institute in the atomic level processing space. That's that's really wonderful. Okay, so it sounds like Tyndall is super robust and pretty comprehensive then for doing the, the modeling for the atomic level processes. When, when you started in 1997, was, uh, was Simon Elliot already there? Was there already some plan for doing uh, atomic level processing modeling or was that pretty early in the ALD days, I'd say? Yeah, at, at that time, no, we, we were focused on, actually the first project was on um, the, the melting of liquid crystal polymers for device packaging. So at that time, we, we were getting up to 500 megahertz processor speed, which obviously sounds a bit slow now, but the heat generated was, was very, very intense. And so the, the solutions at the time for packaging would melt under those temperatures. So we, we had an, a framework for um, EU projects to develop using simulations, new polymers that would, um, that would withstand these temperatures. Um, the work in ALD modeling started um, around 2001 when an EU project came in on high K dielectrics where Simon um, was recruited to, to run that activity and it grew out of, uh, um, out of there. So it's almost, it's 20 years now since we um, started that um, activity at Tyndall. You know, the difference between today and your capability versus 20 years ago, I mean, it has to be uh, an incredible gap. It, it is significant. So, so, you know, 20 years ago, you, 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 you could do small models of perfect surfaces, which, which are, they do have their place. Um, but you have to recognize the limitations. But now with the advances in, in computing hardware, 
and algorithms, etc., we're able to do much larger, more complex models, do large precursors, bring in finite temperature through molecular dynamics simulations, and then evaluate activation barriers for various process steps. So the, 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 there's been a massive shift in capability that is the, the ability to do things we couldn't do before and capacity where you can then run, you can get much higher throughput of um, calculation. So you can compare multiple precursors for the same metal, for example, rather than saying, well, we'll look at this single precursor for our metal and see what happens. We can now say, you know, if you give us six or seven precursors, we can screen them all for their chemistry. So it, it, it allows us to do both capability and capacity. And this, I think, is quite attractive for, um, for the, the industry people who, who do see the value of doing this modeling as the first step in developing um, a, a, a new process. Could you walk me through what a kind of typical project would look like or how, how you would start with, with a a modeling process if you were going to evaluate a precursor or yeah so um i i'll i'll, I'll try to give a concrete example because that's probably the easiest so as part of a, a science foundation ireland funded project um on metal nitrides as barrier layers we looked at the um process chemistry for cobalt metal deposition using hydrogen and ammonia plasma and cobalt CP to a precursor. And so that involved us building first models of cobalt modified by nitrogen, hydrogen containing species as the surface after you do the plasma step. Okay, so if you think of the second half reaction, you do the plasma, you will get these NH, NH2 species decorating the surface. Analogous to having hydroxyls on a, on a growing oxide after the um, step with ozone or water. So you, we then build models of those surfaces. We establish which um, coverage of those species on your metal is the most stable at a given pressure and temperature. And so we look at the typical temperature you do an ALD process at from the literature. And then you study how that surface reacts with the uh, metal containing precursor, initially single precursor to understand, is there any interaction between the two? What are the activation barriers for hydrogen transfer to eliminate the ligand? Um, in this case, you make CPH. And then um, we've expanded that part of the investigation into looking at coverages of the metal precursor. So these get very large. You need a very large surface model that can accommodate multiple metal precursors. And because there, um, there are some cooperative effects due to the fact you, you have multiple precursors absorbing. So we, we can do up to, on most models, five or six precursors. We can then explore the reaction pathways for the ligand eliminations and tell you what kind of coverage of precursor you'd expect and whether it would be fully, um, whether the ligands would be completely removed or not. So in the case of cobalt, you'd have a cobalt CP remaining. And so there's a certain coverage of that as possible. Then you take that, you then bring in the plasma species now we don't model the plasma itself. That's a completely different state of matter, but the plasma produces radicals. And in the case of the hydrogen ammonia plasma, you would get H, N, and H, N, H2 species all have available electrons. So they're quite reactive. We build models where those are present. We then turn on temperature and dynamics and allow the simulation to run and those species will come and react at the surface in different ways. And we found a, a number of interesting reactions where you'll make various products from CP, you can make CPH, you can make pyridine, you can make ammonia to remove the nitrogen from the surface because obviously you want a metal film. So you need to somehow remove the nitrogen. So we, we think it's removed as ammonia. 
and then you you look at how you might recover the the nh containing species ready for the next step and then if you want to you can repeat that again so it's it's defining a surface first precursor what kind of chemistry results what's left after that chemistry is done second precursor and uh, how do we make the new bonds we want and how do we recover the active species that we need to keep the reaction going so that's your typical flow um, and and then you 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 would you would depending on the problem so if you have a problem where someone says we have this list of precursors um, which ones should we be looking at we would do the metal precursor step on our surface We'd evaluate the thermodynamics, is the reaction favorable? And then we'd look at the activation barrier for the initial hydrogen transfer. And together, those two points of information are usually sufficient to make a call on whether you should use a, a precursor or not. So it allows you to screen away the precursor chemistries that shouldn't work, and therefore save you the time and, and resources on in the lab, so you only study the processes that actually um, have a, a potentially useful chemistry. That's really valuable, I imagine, just from a synthesis standpoint of how I don't have to make this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we also the other thing we also do. Sorry for cutting in. Is 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 we we've done a good bit of work, um, particularly with Anyana Davies' group, on looking at the precursors themselves. So they develop new novel precursors for various metals, um, aminates and, and the like um, with metal nitrogen bonds. And then we've been modeling the structures of those molecules and then their simple ligand elimination chemistry and, and stability to just try and understand why one of them might work better than another or um, sometimes they can't get a structure, a crystal structure. So we, we can provide a structure for that. So we can, you can go all the way to the actual precursor molecules themselves if, if that's what's of interest. So we have some versatility in the types of studies that, that we can do depending on the problem statements that people have. With this example you just gave me on the, the cobalt metal, uh, how long does a calculation like this typically take? So, so much computing power at, at Tyndall Earl, at least you're the largest user <laughs> of, the, uh, of the power. So is it a, is it a quick thing? Is it uh, yeah. some month to get these kinds of results? It's, it, it, so it's that particular project um, that started, the work started in late 2018. Yeah, towards uh, December 2018, we had the first we had the first paper on the nitride terminated cobalt surfaces within six months, and then within six months later, we had the first studies on the cobalt um, precursor chemistry at those surfaces. So we, we we took a year to get to that point. Now that was starting from from zero. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we had to build everything ab initio because no one had done this before. So there's a lot of learning goes into that year. Um, but then the, the subsequent calculations come much faster. Um, and so within three years, we, we've done four very big papers looking at this particular um, approach. And I, I would say if you were to try and do the same in the lab, and I don't know will my experimental friends disagree or not, but could easily take the same length of time. To, to develop and understand the mechanism of your process. So, so now that was a difficult one starting from zero. We've had other projects, particularly industry, where things are a little bit more focused and we've delivered results that were usable by the industry client within six months, um, which was extremely good. So um, that, that depends on the precise question you're looking at. Right. Some of the problems are, um, is this reaction favorable or not? So, and it's on maybe a surface that is, is easy enough to work on or, or you already have models for it. So you can get good results within six months. If you're starting from zero, um, it, it takes at least a year to get to the point where you have 
results that are publishable, which, which is still quite reasonable, I think, when you start from zero. So it will depend on the problem, but within months you can have results that are um, that can be exploited by um, your 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 partners. No, oh, that's that's really nice. I think uh, for those maybe who haven't been experimentalists in the past, it does take <laughs> it does take a while. And my goodness, if there's anything that can save you the time and the troubleshooting that go into why is this not working, <laughs> going through insanity loop of okay i'm gonna yeah. try these things over and over again but i, I yeah. met something similar with this type of work that uh, there's some iterative process during yeah. trying to get results well, what, what kind of output do you usually usually get and then how does that feedback back into yeah sorry so um you you if, if you take a simple example of you you've got your your initial substrate terminate with hydroxyls or, 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 or NH, whatever it might be, you're happy with that. And then you want to look at the metal precursor chemistry. So you, 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 can, you can find many, many, many ways for the metal precursor to interact at the surface, particularly if it's something like a, a, a CP2, right, which can be upright, perpendicular, or it can lie flat, it can lie at an angle. There is different you know, uh, rotations with respect to the underlying substrate. So you have a whole bunch of potential configurations in which this can interact. But you can run all those simultaneously in your calculations. You don't have to wait for one to finish to do the next one. So you might set up 20 of those configurations. You launch them all simultaneously and they'll finish at the same time. So the first thing you get is um, was this a potentially stable interaction mode? Um, if the calculation didn't explode, that's a good start, which can happen. <laughs> Sometimes the, the, the precursor will move away from the surface, which means there's no interaction. It's not favorable. And, and then you find those where the precursor did interact. You calculate the change in energy. I'm going from surface plus free pre precursor to adsorbed precursor. It's just a simple delta E, like an enthalpy. And if that's negative, it's exothermic. So the products are more stable. So you look for that, right? There are negative energies. Yes, let's look further. No, throw them out. Then you'd look at the kind of magnitude of that energy difference. So working in electron volts, if you get around one to two electron volts of a difference, that's, that's pretty good. That's what you're looking for. Any smaller, it's liable to undergo desorption because this, the binding strength's not big enough. Any bigger, and it's kind of too stable at the surface and won't necessarily undergo further chemistry. So it's like putting carbon monoxide on an oxide where you make carbonates and then things stop because they're just too stable. So we have this moderation principle in surface chemistry when we do these calculations that the, the the change in energy is not too small and not too big. Um, and so you, that then allows you to assess how does the precursor interact at my surface? I take those couple of interesting adsorption modes and then I will calculate the barrier for hydrogen transfer from the surface to eliminate one of the ligands. And that's the massive time consuming step, okay? Because you, you, you have to basically build a pathway of configurations as the hydrogen migrates from the surface up to the ligand, attaches to the ligand and then the ligand migrates. So you, you put in a series of snapshots along that and calculate all those and you get out the activation barrier. And again, you're looking for moderation, right? Um, anything above 0.8 EV or so, we tend to say, well, that's going to require quite high temperatures and you may be limited in the temperatures you could do a process at, particularly if it's back end of line. Um, so if you get an activation barrier of, say, 0.5 EV, that's usually happy. Um, that's quite moderate. So you're not going to need to go to you know, 500 Celsius to overcome that barrier. And, and so that may further um, reduce the space of chemistries that you want to look at. So structure, stability, energy difference, um, and the activation barrier are the kind of key outputs where we can say, this is why process A is good, and this is why process B is not so good. If you needed to validate things, you can strike out the ones that were 
you know, not so good. And you yeah. can come back and then it's a much smaller data set that you have to work with. And I imagine yeah. much quicker to then just confirm that what you were seeing was, um, I guess, uh, sufficient for, for yeah. those themselves. Exactly, yeah. And, and sometimes you, you then get people would say, well, this process didn't work. Could you do some calculations to understand why? And you, you, you'd you see from those quantities that maybe the, the, uh, the energy difference isn't big enough for you to have species at the surface to go do the chemistry or the activation barrier is way too high. Or sometimes what happens is if, if you run a finite temperature simulation, what you thought was a stable precursor absorption actually isn't, and it moves away from the surface during the simulation. So desorption is promoted by, by temperature. Um, if you think it gives free energies, etc. cetera. So, so we, we, we can go either predict something or we can explain a result that someone may have. I mean, that's a, a good segue then to you know, what are the limitations then for these processes? And I'll have another follow-up question about your kind of interaction now that you have an experimentalist on your team as well, but where do the modeling processes fall short right now? That's, uh, yeah, it might. Yeah to the process or to whoever is hoping to use these results. Yeah, so as, as you know, as I'm sure you're aware, all, all modeling has limitations, right? And all models are wrong, just some are less wrong than others. So the, the, the main limit, okay, there's a couple. One of the big ones is, is um, size, that ideally you'd like to do a substrate that more represents what you have in your ALD chamber. Um, you know, maybe even one by one square centimeter is, is huge for us, right? So we're, we're talking tens of nanometers by tens of nanometers substrate. So it's quite small um, not necessarily possible to include every feature that's present, like structural defects, et cetera, scratches, which can impact what's happening. So you have some size limitations in your model. We can routinely do thousand atoms with our first principles calculations. Um, but those are those require very significant computing resources. So you, you, you have that limit. You can only do, um, most of the time you do one precursor molecule um, because that's faster than trying to do higher coverages. So higher coverages come at higher cost. Um, and, and we tend to do one cycle at most rather than doing multiple cycles, just because it can take it could take six months to generate the data for a single cycle, as, as I was saying earlier, depending on the complexity. So, um, you know, we're, we're providing very specific data. So from the first principles, you won't get growth per cycle. You won't get change in mass per cycle, that kind of thing. You, you might be able to say something about the potential density of the resulting film, but that's not ideal either. Um, the standard first principles calculations don't include temperature. So you put that in via molecular dynamics, which then has its own um, issues that you have to, to deal with that. If the time scale for a, a process or a, a reaction within the deposition is say microseconds, um, we're, doing, we're doing hundreds of picoseconds maybe a nanosecond at most, right? So you have this massive difference in the timescales that you can reach. So rare events would not be easily um, found in those types of calculations. So then um, you can look at efforts around um, techniques like kinetic Monte Carlo, which Simon has uh, had done work on and there was work in, in um, Finland in Kari Lassinen's group on this. So that, that's a really interesting way forward because it lets you do much bigger substrates, temperatures included, and you can actually um, extract those macroscopic parameters like the growth per cycle and the change in mass per cycle, but um, th they have their own issues. Um, <clears throat> so you, as long as you understand what's possible and what's not possible, then the, the modeling becomes um, quite powerful. Those limitations tend to become less severe over time as we get better resources, better algorithms, et cetera. But 
there's still they're an issue for anyone doing modeling of surfaces or solid materials right that everything's finite sized and there is a limit to the number of atoms you can include so you have to try and be smart about the type of calculation you do i suppose a further one is is um is you can only explore a, a limited space of potential configurations right um so if, if you have a, a coverage of say hydroxyl groups on a surface that you know is let's say you know 60 percent as a as a random number and um, there are many many ways to have 60 percent coverage by distributing the hydroxyls in different ways and trying to enumerate all those um it, it isn't always possible so there's always a little bit of a risk that you might have missed a, a configuration that could be important. So using machine learning type approaches, um, we're, we're trying to see, can we overcome those difficulties um, to allow us to look at a much bigger space of potential configurations? These things are kind of in their infancy at the moment, but they show some, some reasonable promise. So yeah, it's, it's really interesting that I think a lot of people can see the power that there is in having these modeling um, either before or, or during. But you mentioned that you have an experimentalist now working mm -hmm. in the group as well, one experimentalist. Um, so what is the interaction then between those who are doing the computations and those who are doing the experiments? Because it seems as though, you know, maybe we're working towards having modeling be the very, very beginning, but we still haven't crossed that, that interaction threshold between theory and, and experiment yet. Yeah, yeah, like you, 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 you're going to need both, right? So the modeling is, is, is a way to make a sensible choice of precursor chemistry. And, and so I, I, I try to see it as, as another tool. This tool is now used before you do any experiments rather than, you know, afterwards, like you do in characterization. Um, so we, how this came about was we have, um, we have an industry supported project in the medical devices space um, where we're trying, where we've used our modeling to develop some novel materials and their deposition process. And we needed to hire someone to work with a colleague to um, test our predictions. So um, obviously since this is a commercially supported project, I can't say anything about the details um, but the, the, the idea is uh, we calculated um, a couple of interesting molecules that seemed to show the characteristics we were looking for. We calculated a deposition chemistry using our standard approach, which, which looked quite favorable. And so um, Alessandra, who's the, the experimental postdoc, she has gone and she has done deposition of this material um, at a collaborator's lab on various substrates. And it turns out that the deposition process works. Uh, which is really nice. Um, the properties of the resulting coating are, are pretty good. So this is really um, exciting for us and the industry partner as well, because they knew nothing about this kind of work. Um, they, they, to them, 10 microns, for example, is rough. Okay, obviously to us, <laughs> we live on, on, on different length scales here. So we, we managed to show them a combination of atomistic modeling and ALD can be very powerful to find new materials to replace some of the materials they're using now and to do the deposition and onto complex substrates as well. So it's not just flat coupons, you can do it on, on all sorts of interesting structures. So Alessandra has, has done over the last few months, a lot of work on that. And um, so taking our predictions and then realizing them in the in the lab and she's also done the characterization of, of those materials the other thing she's doing is coming from um our, our large project on nitride barrier materials where we predicted um if you take tantalum nitride and put ruthenium in the um, surface layer you'll have a, a material that does the same job as a barrier and a seed layer to allow deposition of metallic copper films for the interconnects in semiconductor devices. Um, and, and the reason that's important is as, as the devices shrink, the volume available to put down your copper wires gets smaller. But copper down at these nanometer length scales, that deposits as little islands or clusters of copper, which are obviously non-conducting. 
So you're trying to find a way to make the substrate on which you deposit the copper such that it will promote the formation of the, the, the conducting films rather than the clusters. And so one of the PhD students and the postdoc worked out a, a combination of ruthenium and tantalum nitride uh, where you don't have to put down a separate seed layer, but you combine them into the nitride and that will actually promote the wetting of copper in 2D film deposition, which is conducting. So that came out a couple of months ago and it was a really cool example of how you can use um, standard calculations plus dynamics to explore the, the growth of, um, of metal uh, films on the substrate. So we, we, we had then in the original proposal, the idea was to find this material and then go and deposit it with ALD and do some tests on it. So at the moment, Alessandra is working on developing a process for tantalum nitride deposition and then take that and at the end, so this is the theory guy thinking, right? At the end of the, the, the process, you swap out the tantalum for ruthenium. So you can incorporate some ruthenium into the surface layer. So it doesn't go into the bulk, right? We, we, we don't need it in the bulk. We just want it in the surface layer. And then we can do, we can make test structures with that, with copper and our characterization colleagues here can then test the performance of, of this um, of this device. So, so Alessandra can take results from our predictions, and then she can go and develop an ALD process that will allow direct verification of, of what we're doing. So this is really, really nice to have directly within the group. Um, because you know collaborations are, are wonderful and we have some great collaborations, but obviously you're relying on other people to, to deliver or to accommodate your work in their schedule, et cetera. So being able to do it in-house is, is, is also very nice. Well, this, is, this is great. That's, it sounds like this is something that's kind of moving towards having, uh, yeah, this kind of predictive analysis, predictive results from the modeling before doing any type of experiment. Is this some of the, the first examples of the process directly from the atomistic modeling beforehand? Certainly within our group, um, it, yeah, we, we, this, is, this is what we've developed over the last three years or so. Um, I guess most of the work in, in, in modeling ALD processes has been to understand existing processes and mechanisms but you know there there, there, there has been there has been work where, where people are combining the two so I, I I know there was interesting work out of Aaron Kessel's lab on doing MOS2 and and you to do surface pretreatment which was kind of you you could say the calculations were able to to predict what that should be and then you go do the deposition so we, we see examples of it um Henrik Pedersen's doing interesting work to explore the chemistries for, for three nitride depositions. Um, so I think we're seeing that growing, definitely. And we'd like to be the, at the forefront of actually doing that and, and make that our, 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 our business. So it's predictive rather than um, reactive, shall we say. And where do you see the future of this modeling going? What, what do you hope in the next five, 10 years you'll be able to have the capacity or the capability to do? Yeah. So um, what we'd like to do is I mentioned the kinetic Monte Carlo earlier that had been used. I would like to see that become much simpler to use. So if you think of, of um, current semiconductor device processing simulation using TCAD, Right, a, a process engineer puts in their requirements and parameters, et cetera, and, and the TCAD software tells you what happens in an oxidation step or an implantation step before you ever go near the fab, right? So you can work out your, your processes. So I, I want to see something like that for um, atomic level processing, and it can be ALD, MLD, ALE. It, it's ideally be great to do for all of them. So essentially a process engineer, um, needs to do an ALD film of, you know, a, a, a high K, a five nanometer thickness on this substrate. And the, the engineer has a library of precursors they could use so they can select 
you know, I'm going to take three precursors and I've got a hydroxylated silica substrate and I want to run at some temperature for some time. Um, here's the pulse length of, of each precursor. And um, please tell me what, what I will end up with, right? Give me the growth per cycle, the mass change per cycle, an analysis of the crystallinity of the resulting film. Because now with the Monte Carlo, you can grow a thick enough film that you could analyze the crystallinity. Right? And there's a lot of interest, obviously, in direct deposition of highly crystalline films. Um, so you don't have to, to take an amorphous as deposited and then treat it at high temperature. Right? If you do epitaxial crystalline, you'd, you'd overcome um, a, a lot of difficulties. And so you plug those in and then the calculation comes back and says, um, here, here is the kind of process space you should be working in in order to get those. And that would be controlled by using machine learning and artificial intelligence to set up and run everything and make the various decisions, right? So I run at some temperature, I get out my, my, the results I'm looking, looking for, and then the AI can decide on the basis of those results versus the target, what you should change. Should maybe the temperature be increased by some amount? Um, and the machine learning can be useful in order to generate the parameters you need for the Monte Carlo using your first principles data. So that would be very cool to, to see. And it's like an atomistic TCAD. The device people are, are, are kind of at that point where they, they now treat quantum mechanical, um, or sorry, they now can quantum mechanically treat the um, electron transport, et cetera, in, in devices. And so we're not there with process simulation. And, and that's, that's our big ambition over the next, um, well, however long it takes, is, is to find a, an, an atomistic ALD TCAD uh, tool and then ultimately link it with a device um, TCAD tool as well. So you can do the whole lot in one seamless, um, uh, process. Uh, that is incredibly fascinating. I think I don't. I don't want to speak for everybody, but for myself, who do, do not have a background in modeling or theory or computation, I think sometimes a lot of stuff that's happening can feel very much like a monolith, and that it's all you know kind of lumped into into modeling. Or modeling is also the same as machine learning or something like this. And the, mm. the is the scene. So I think the same, you start to see all the knobs that you can turn as an experimentalist. You start to see all of the knobs that are now also available on the, on the computer. It's not just yeah. modeling isn't the same as machine learning. And they, they are all of these kind of separate but still interconnected things that uh, help you um, get to yeah, the, the uh, result that you are hoping to get to. Maybe not the result, yeah. but the, a way to get you oh, at least... Easy. And, uh, a, a useful result. Exactly. Right? So re remember that that a, a result that says this process won't work is just as useful, mm -hmm. right? Probably even more so because it stops you going down the wrong path. Obviously, it's difficult to publish such things, but if if an industry client says, you know, will this process work, and we say no, then it means they don't have to invest resources in, mm -hmm. in doing it. So there isn't really a negative result for me in doing these, these studies, they're, they're useful results. Right. Information is information. Yeah. Exactly. Something that I think is interesting for me is, as I have tried to explain ALD to some people, or if I explain it to somebody who doesn't have a, a background, like our picture of ALD is it's kind of simple. It's mm. pulse a precursor, interacts with the surface, purge it out, do it again with another one, purge it out, and there's cycle that over and over again. But we're starting to see as we dig into the mechanisms of ALD more that it's not obviously not that simple. Has there been something in your experience with modeling these processes that has made us kind of rethink the way that ALD or even now like ALE, which is something a lot, a lot newer, makes us rethink the way that these processes are working? Um, <clears throat> yeah, that's, that's a good question. I, I don't think that we, we, the modeling has overturned any, um, any previous notions 
right? Um, I, I think it gives you the, the detail on what is plausible. Um, what, what it might do is, is help us maybe better understand how some impurities are incorporated into a, um, into a film. Mm -hmm. So um, if, 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 if I have a nitrogen-based plasma process for a metal um, <clears throat> and, and the calculations are clear that you, know, you can't fully eliminate all the nitrogen in, 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 in any step, then um, you know, does one need to rethink um, how one sets up that particular process or do you just have to live with the fact there will be an incorporation of these species and your job is to minimize that so that if you want to deposit a metal, it behaves as a metal even with some amount of, of nitrogen or in it. So that it, it might help us, it, it may help provoke discussions around um, how we approach developing certain processes. Um, the, the, the other thing perhaps is, is um, we, we've shown that ALE chemistry on crystalline and amorphous oxides is actually very, very different in the HF containing pulse. Um, and up to, up to that work, my own humble thought on it was that we had empirical data that said there was differences in the etch rates. Um, and you, you, you might say that, oh, the HF interacts differently at the amorphous material. So we've managed to extract some, some finer detail um, on that. So, so that might be um, uh, of use. And um, <clears throat> but beyond that, I, I I think I think any any change in how we understand what's happening will probably come about due to the interaction between the atomistic modeling and the experimental side. Um, I, I I don't I think modeling on its own isn't necessarily able to to make those kinds of um, statements at least the modeling that, that we do. Um, so you do need that, that constant interaction with, with the experiments. Um, so, you know, we, we will see how, how it develops over the, next, um, over the next few years. Oh, that's, uh, that's great sign. I didn't know if, uh, if it would or if it wouldn't, but again, as we were just saying, any information is useful information. Um, or we're running up on our, our time here. These, mm. these conversations go faster and faster. <laughs> I, I do. They do. <laughs> That's something earlier that, that, that stuck with me and I wanted to ask when you, you said, you know, sometimes a calculation can explode and it just made me think about, you know, the accidents that happen in labs ah, and like a yeah. TN or something like that is pretty, pretty common. You, know, you open it up, yeah. it gets done and you put a little drop of water in there and then it's, you know, it's, uh, yeah, it's on fire for a little bit. But yeah. what, what is, uh, you know, a, a theorist or somebody who's doing computation, what's the, the nightmare scenario? What are the accidents that happen in the <laughs> There's a, yeah, the, the, there's a few. Luckily, I suppose, to, before I say anything, no one gets hurt in mm -hmm. these accidents. Um, and it, it, it's a few electrons have been sacrificed. Um, so it's it, it's relatively safe to to have a modeling accident. One of the the main ones you do actually is you mislabel your atoms when you build the inputs, and so you say your metal and your oxygen in an oxide can get swapped, um, which then leads to interesting um, chemistry, um, and and that's something you, you you have to be careful when you're setting up right that the atoms are correctly labeled and defined. The input parameters in your controlling file, which um, set up the, the type of calculation you're doing and, and the convergence, et cetera, that those are sensible and, and, and reasonable. So for example, if you have an even number of electrons, um, that's quite a different calculation to if you have an odd number of electrons. And if you try and do an odd number of electrons in the same setup as an even number, 
you're going to run into, in, into trouble. Um, you can't put charged species into these calculations because of their periodicity. Mm -hmm. So you can't get an energy that, that, that's useful. And then sometimes what happens is that the calculation that you've set up, the, the atomic structure you begin with just isn't favorable. And literally a molecule will explode and you'll just see the, const, the atoms completely separated in your simulation box. Um, and, and as I said, luckily only a few electrons are, are harmed in that particular process. So some calculations are actually quite sensitive to the initial uh, starting conditions, sh shall we say. And um, you may have to run through that um, three or four times to actually get a, a stable structure. Sometimes you have to help the calculation find a, a structure and, and kind of guide it to a particular point where it goes the, the, the right way. So it's far from perfect, um, but you, you, you do need to understand um, the chemistry of the system you're looking at. You know what, if, if you put in an, a, an oxygen carbon bond and it's got a distance of 0.5 angstrom, you know, you should know that that's just wrong. Right, it should be much longer, you know, say 1.2 angstrom as you have in free CO2. So that will lead to problems. Um, or if you try and, you know, put five atoms around a carbon in your calculation, you know, well, you've only yourself to blame for, for that one, right? So, so you, you, you need to use your chemistry knowledge and then you need to understand the, the limits of the calculation model that you're using and always be able to say, where, um, how far can I go with this? Okay, and, and what are the limitations that I've had to impose on the calculation um, be, before I run it? So it, it, it's not a black box process, thankfully. Um, although, you know, it's, some people would like, would like us to believe, particularly in the molecular community, that you can just throw your molecule into a code and it'll come out with the right answers. Um, certainly in the solids and surfaces world, it's, it's, it's nowhere near like that. Good. Well, maybe I'll set a disclaimer on here that no electrons were harmed in the making of the <laughs> test. <laughs> yeah, I always look after my electrons when where possible. Well, good, Michael. Uh, this has been so much fun. I've had such a good time talking with you today. As I mentioned, I didn't know much about modeling, but it, I hoped it would be a learning experience for me, and it, it definitely was. So uh, thank, you thank you so much for taking an hour out of your day and chatting with me. This has been and really fantastic. Thanks a million for the opportunity, Tyler. I really appreciate it. And congratulations on this series. Um, I've listened to, to nearly all the previous episodes, and you learned something from each one of them. So you've done a fantastic job um, with some great people. So thank you. I look so forward to seeing the next ones. I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. It's been a very, uh, very gratifying, I think, experience being part of this. And I'm really happy that uh, Benek has allowed me the chance to, to take it over. So mm. being a, a chance to meet a lot of really great people and have some good conversations. And uh, it's, it's only for the better, I think. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, agreed. And, and, and it, it increases the reach. You know, you, you never know who will end up hearing something. And, uh, and and benefit from it. So yeah, fantastic initiative. Okay. Thank you, thank you again. Um, before we sign off here, uh, do you have any any social media websites that you would like to shout out? Places where people can follow you and follow your work. Oh, <laughs> well, I think my, I, I suspect most of the community who'd be listening um, already follow me on Twitter. But in case anyone is interested in ALD retweets, um, <laughs> it's M I C K double underscore G E E K because single underscore was taken. But actually, a good one is, is the CVD ALD papers bot, um, which um, retweets uh, papers in this space as they're published. So that's a nice way to kind of keep up with, with what's happening. And of course, anyone going to Ghent in June, I am the co-social media chair. So I will be um, 
looking for photo opportunities, etc., um, to uh, promote uh, everyone meeting together um, for the first time since we were in Seattle, uh, Bellevue. So I look forward to that. Fantastic. Are you going to be going around with a nice DSLR the whole conference? Uh, it, it, well, it, it, it might be an old fashioned phone camera, <laughs> but um, we, we, we may have a couple of surprises for, for people. So watch this space and look forward to seeing everyone. Yes, yes, absolutely. Again, thanks so much for your time. This yeah, was thanks, Emil. That was great. I really appreciate it. Um, and like I said, great series. Really, really great. It, it kind of brings out a human side from, 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 from the area, which is really good. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, we spend all our time around machines, so. <laughs> <laughs> we, we'll, I guess we'll talk to you soon then. That sounds Come good. Yourself, Tyler. Take it easy. You too as well. All right, take Bye. care. You're listening to ALD Stories with Benek, the home of ALD. To stay tuned for new episodes, make sure to follow us on Spotify, Google Podcasts, or Apple Podcasts. We hope you enjoyed today's show. Talk to you in the next one.